the browser before we get in. First question. Spend 10 seconds, 15 seconds, whatever it takes to think about this. Use your fingers, count. How many languages are you proficient in? How many languages have you programmed in? All right, if it's more than two, put up your hand. Three, so drop your hand if it's less than. So three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, <laughs> okay, we got 10. What are some of the 10, just out of curiosity? No Python allowed. OK, so that's a good sample. Um, well, I'm not sure that that is the case, right? Because uh, we have a very diverse community. Uh, we have many different languages. And we tend to use many different tools. Ruby is not the end all of all languages. In fact, I'm pretty sure that most of us came to Ruby from some other language, right? Which is why virtually everybody in this room put up their hand as more than two languages. And I'm pretty sure that Ruby is not going to be the last language that you're going to learn either, right? So there's going to be more tools. And then we look at something like the browser, right? So the browser is an interesting beast. It's this new platform that we invented. And we have, you know, if you look at a very high level, we have the CSS um, engine, there's the JavaScript engine, there's the DOM, there's the layout, um, and everything in between. And the HTML5, uh, standard tries to kind of put all of that together. And in my view, and some, I, know I should preface this and I should say, I'm a big fan of HTML5. I love what they're doing. I, I buy the vision. I um, even bought the, uh, you know, the mandatory t-shirt and all the rest. <laughs> but they, in my view, they're kind of trying to force a monoculture, right? It's like there's one way to do it. There's a JavaScript way to do it and you're stuck in that world. And I don't necessarily buy that. Because even as you look at the history, you'll find that you know, we, have, we have, of course, CSS, JavaScript, and DOM. But then there is the supporting cast of thousands at the bottom, right? the stuff that some of us love to hate, so ActiveX. You know, and this is from um, left to right, probably in the order of pain that they've caused to the web. So ActiveX, we we're still trying to actively wipe from our memory and all of the compromised computers out there. Um, action script, um, like it or hate it, um, it's been a giant uh, bridge for us, right? It's, it's Flash. It's what enabled video. This is why we have all of this technology. So it has been critical in the evolution of the web. Java applets, we won't even go there. Um, never happened, right? But there's, there's a lot more. Now, my personal relationship with JavaScript went something like this, right? I didn't know it. Henceforth, I didn't like it. Um, then I had a miserable experience um, trying to program to the DOM with it. And this is probably you know, five or six years ago. And I hated it. Then I took a long pause. Then jQuery came out. Um, I was playing with Rails. And I was like, hey, look, this is actually not as painful as I thought. Then I actually had a very good experience. I wrote a Firefox extension, which was basically pure JavaScript, no interaction with the DOM. And somewhere in there, I, I realized that JavaScript is actually a pretty nice and beautiful language. Right? The moment I stepped away from the DOM, I didn't have to deal with all the browser quirks and all the rest. I actually had um, a lot of fun. Later, as the extension evolved and I had to maintain it, um, I learned that you know, there, there's a few pitfalls. Um, the testing was very hard. The maintenance was very hard and all the rest. So long story short, I like it. I think JavaScript is great. I'm not trying to dissuade anybody from away from using JavaScript. Um, but I also have this theory that JavaScript is maybe possibly a monopoly. Right? This is actually kind of crazy when you think about the ECMA um, standards body. Would you ever trust all the major vendors to get together and invent a language and then all of us would have to program to it? <laughs> well, that, that is JavaScript. That is ECMA. Right? That is what we're actually putting up with. And it's kind of crazy. And I, I don't necessarily think uh, JavaScript is bad, but I don't think this is a good position to be in either, right? Because diversity is good. Um, we just said that we like many different languages. There's different ideas. There's different approaches. Um, there is no one particular solution that is better. Uh, and even if we look at the Ruby ecosystem, 
Um, so I, I stole the slide from Constantine from his uh, talk yesterday. I think this is fascinating and amazing. Um, these are all the different um, implementations of Ruby in various states of incompleteness, right? I'm, I'm pretty sure that 90% of these won't even run any semi-reasonable Ruby code. But that's not the point. The point is people are experimenting. They're trying different things. Um, they're trying to see what sticks. Case in point, OfficeScript. So I had this idea of Ruby in a browser for a long time now. And I've been talking to a bunch of people and you know, they kept saying like, well, why do you need that? That's crazy. You know, JavaScript is awesome. Now I'm talking to the same people this year and they're like, look, we got CoffeeScript. It's awesome. It's like, yeah, exactly, because that's what I was talking about all, all, all along. They're like, no, 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 but it's just, it's the same thing, it's JavaScript. So this is one instance of where we innovated uh, within the browser and everybody goes crazy over it, right? So imagine what would happen if we actually had more languages, more possibilities of running the stuff in the browser. Now, this is, uh, a good time for me to step back and actually say, so yes, I work for Google now, and um, I'm not affiliated with a native client, Chrome, any other teams. My, I'm only pathologically curi uh, curious, so I, you know, I tend to talk to a lot of those guys, but all, all opinions are my own. I'm not trying to um, convey anything in that sense. So, uh, Ruby in the browser, wouldn't that be nice, right? Uh, wh what would that look like? But let's take that a step further. It's not just about Ruby, right? It, I would actually really like to see all of the other languages in the browser as well. C-sharp? Why not? Right? Um, Fortran, maybe? <laughs> you think I'm joking. Assembly? Why not? Actually, we'll, we'll see an example. <laughs> so first example. Have you guys tried this? Uh, this actually. Um, launched, uh, I guess, two days ago, uh, a refresh to tryruby.org. Very, very awesome project. Let's see if we can actually pull this off. Wow. Okay. So you have an interactive shell in the browser. This is pretty awesome. So. But, so this is technically Ruby in the browser, but how does it work, right? If we go to inspect element, load up our network tab. You'll actually see that it's making a web request. All right, and if you look at the web request, you can see that it's actually sending a command, um, form data, and it gets a response back from the server. So it's not really Ruby in the browser. So this is an awesome project, but it's not really what we're looking for. Here. So of course, uh, being curious, you know, I started playing with this thing, and here's an example of interacting with a try Ruby service. You know, so I'm using remote service to execute Ruby code. Um, pretty nice. Turns out they're actually running Ruby 192. Um, all that's all clever, but of course, you know, you give somebody a a fun tool to play with, and then the next thing I'm finding myself experimenting with is like, well, what can I do, right? Because <laughs> I'm not trying to be malicious, and by the way, if anybody from um, Envy Labs is here, I'm sorry for the slide, but um, it is to illustrate a point, right? So security is always tough. So here, what I'm doing is I'm sending a command, and I'm saying, hey, there's a string called A, and just you know, make that a 32 megabyte string of A's, and just allocate that on, on the server. and you know, that's kind of malicious, silly, and not very productive. But um, you can see how this can be abused easily. So this is not great. So what would it take to actually get Ruby running in the browser? Um, has anybody tried this? Um, turns out there's been actually a couple of different teams, and I'm going to pick on three um, in this presentation, and it, this is not a complete list. So first one is a project uh, called Gestalt. Uh, by the Microsoft team, which is actually pretty awesome. Um, they came out with this project probably two years ago, and very few people paid attention to this. <coughs> what it is, is, I know I see a bunch of people typing, so I'll, I'll leave this slide for a second. The link is at the bottom. So what, what it is, 
or what it allows you to do is to have code like this in your browser. So instead of saying script type JavaScript, right? why should we declare JavaScript every time we write JavaScript? Because we know it's only JavaScript anyway. right? Like, what's the point? So now we're actually using that. And we're saying, hey, this is actually text Ruby. And we're going to define an onClick handler. And the onClick handler is going to pop up an alert box. And then we're going to create a, um, an event handler. And I think this is pretty awesome. Right here, we're going to grab the method handle on the onClick handler and assign that to be the onClick handler. So we are actually exercising the power of Ruby. We're grabbing the, uh, the method handle and assigning it as a callback, which is pretty cool. So imagine you could write this um, in your browser. Of course, some of you will come out and say, well, that's like CoffeeScript, right? We have that. Um, but hey, this was here two years ago, and you have the full uh, metaprogramming cap capabilities of Ruby in a browser. So how does this work? Microsoft has this project which a lot of people love to hate called Silverlight. Silverlight actually embeds the DLR, their DLR, which is dynamic language runtime on which projects like Iron Ruby, Iron Python, and a bunch of others run, right? So in fact, um, C Sharp, F Sharp um, would run on uh, the DLR. And then they built this shim, which is the Gestalt layer, which is the library. And basically what it provides is a way to communicate between the browser and the DLR, right? So you have the Silverlight, um, basically plugin, um, running inside of the browser, and then you're just communicating back and forth. And you can manipulate the DOM, you can do anything that you would effectively in your JavaScript runtime. So that's, I think that's pretty awesome. Now, unfortunately, what I don't know is whether there's actually a future for Silverlight or even Iron Ruby for that matter. Um, unfortunately, it seems like Silverlight got positioned as you know, a flash killer, a video substitute, and it was actually much more, or it is much more than that, because it has the full DLR capabilities and all the rest. So it's unclear now uh, what's happening um, with Silverlight, at least within Microsoft. And likewise, for Iron Ruby, um, a couple of the core committers have moved on. Um, it's, I'm not sure what the status of the project is. So I hope uh, both of these uh, directions continue to get explored. I think it's a very interesting project. And I think a lot of people underestimate the usefulness of Silverlight. So now I think it's a good point to actually take a brief, uh, brief uh, detour. I did not know much about browser plugins when I got um, into researching this topic, and I thought it was actually very interesting to understand what they are, how they work, and why we have some of the solutions designed the way they are today. So here's a fun story. So we have Netscape. Um, Netscape's uh, just launched. It's hot. And we're doing a demo to Jim Clark, who was the CEO of Netscape at the time. And a couple of Adobe guys come in, and they demo this thing to him, uh, which is previously in the browser, the only thing you could do, or the only thing that the browser understood uh, was images, right? So you have an image tag. It would detect that it's the, the right MIME type and pull an image and display it. So Adobe guys had this vision of like, well, when you click on a PDF file, it should just seamlessly um, show up in your browser instead of invoking a download. And then you have to go into your download folder and open it an external app. So they demo this. They, they built a tool. They demo it. And you know, great success. Um, very exciting. Who's helping you? Oh, we just reverse engineered it. All right. So um, they, weren't, they didn't actually invent or work with Netscape to invent um, a way to do this. They, they basically looked at the code, reverse engineered it, and made it work. So you know, depending on your view, you can call that a lot of people interpret Adobe's products as malware. You know, maybe this is the inception of it all. Um, but anyway, out of that experience, the NP API, which stands for Netscape Plugin API, was born, which actually became the standard in all of the browsers. So IE, Firefox, Chrome, um, and all, all the others use NP API, which is basically um, a fairly simple API for uh, defining how do you communicate with the browser. So you have a binary that wants to do something and it needs to communicate to the browser. NP API is that bridge. So how does it work? The rendering engine uh, basically looks at all of the file types that it's pulling in. If it recognizes a registered file type or a MIME type, in this case, uh, let's say a music MP3 file, it says, oh yeah, I have a plugin that's registered to do that or registered to interpret that. I'll just pass it off to that plugin. 
So this is how your uh, QuickTime works or Acrobat works and all the rest. So a pretty simple bridge. Um, just to visualize it a little bit better, we have the DOM, we have the uh, Netscape plugin API, and then we have a bunch of external binaries, right? So there's Flash, Silverlight, uh, what have you. You can build your own. Now, it turns out there's a couple of problems with this. First, the binaries themselves, by design, are standalone processes, right? So they run outside of the browser, and uh, they have full access to your operating system, to your file system, to your everything on the, on the computer, and that gives them great power to do very cool things, but it also means that they can wreak complete havoc on your system, which is why a lot of people love to hate plugins. Because as a manufacturer of the browser, put yourself into Netscape, Chrome, Firefox, Choose, guess who gets blamed when your computer gets infected with a virus? Oh, it's the browser. I navigated to this bad site. It installed this crap on my computer. And now you know, Firefox is a terrible browser. And of course, Firefox has nothing to do with this. right? It's because you installed some dumb plugin somewhere earlier on, and now it's getting exploited. So browser manufacturers are actively trying to push away from this uh, plugin architecture, and which is why they're also trying to enforce, hey, everything has to run within this HTML5 sandbox. We're not going to let you pull in external processes. So it makes sense, uh, but you know, this is something that we had to deal with, or have to deal with still. So then Google Chrome uh, comes along, which is actually fairly recent. It, it seems kind of crazy. You know, it wasn't that long ago when I remember when I saw the announcement, I was incredulous, right? It's kind of like, you crazy? Why do we need another browser? And of course now, um, Chrome is gaining market share. So IE and Firefox are both losing market share. As of September, um, Chrome is, I think, 26% across the internet and growing. So within a month or two, they'll actually be the second uh, browser on the web, which is actually pretty amazing if you think about it. And uh, Firefox will get pushed down to three, and I'm sure that you know, IE will slowly but surely kind of yield control of that. Wow, okay. So the comment is, um, it won't because of China. Moving on, all right. <laughs> all right. China and Google, yeah, not my topic. <laughs> so the interesting thing about uh, Chrome, the innovation, if you will, that they did was uh, they said, hey, every tab is going to be a standalone process. Instead of having one process and many tabs with it, every single tab is going to be isolated. So this gives you some nice things, like everybody has own security sandbox, so if something goes wrong in one tab, it won't affect anything else. In fact, we can just kill that one tab, and you know, everything's great. So that's cool. One problem. So now we're back to the same Flash movie on our web page. What does that mean for security? So we've isolated every tab into a process, uh, but how are we going to isolate the Flash movie? Just reviewing what we saw earlier, right? So we have the browser, we have the plugin API, and then we have Flash. So you have this external binary. And security is one of the probably most important things that Chrome is focusing on. Um, probably goes hand in hand with speed but security comes first. So they won't trade off speed for security. So they came up with an interesting solution. And there's two things in here. So there's the native client, and then there's the Pepper, uh, Pepper API. And if you don't get the joke, so native client is salt, shortened to knackle, and you have salt and pepper. So what is Pepper? Pepper is basically an update to NP API, to Netscape plugin API. It's basically the same thing, cleaned up a little bit, repackaged. Um, they proposed it. It's a standard. Firefox has adopted it. More browsers are coming along. And in fact, you know, they built the WebKit um, integration. So um, I'm not sure what state Safari is in, but it should be in, available in there as well. So we have this Pepper bridge, which is basically just a cleanup. And then we have native client. So what is native client? Native client is a sandboxing technology for safe execution of native code. So let's unpack that a little bit. 
It is actually native machine code that runs on your CPU, right? It is not an interpreter. The way I kind of drew it here is a little bit misleading. It looks like we have this plugin which runs inside of a sandbox uh, or the, the NACL uh, sandbox, but it's not the case that the, the plugin is getting interpreted or going through a bridge. What happens is you actually compile the code and, it, and NACL provides some safety guarantees. So a little bit closer to what's uh, happening under the hood. You have your C, C++ code, and you compile it with a specialized tool chain that the NACL team provides. So there's the modified GC compiler, et cetera. You, because you're using this tool chain, you do have to compile to different architectures, so 32, 64, ARM, and, and all the rest. Um, it generates a, man <coughs> a manifest file, and then, um, which, which then gets loaded by the browser. So how does the security part work? And I should also preface this and say I'm not the security expert here. I, you know, there's a lot of very interesting and good information on the, um, if you follow that link at the bottom. But basically what happens is when you compile, so first there's a static compile that you have to do as a developer, right? So to build that uh, native uh, client uh, executable, when the code, th then the code gets loaded by the browser. So a visitor comes to your site, that executable gets loaded. At that time, the NACL runtime actually does a verification of the code. So it basically looks at all the instructions that are within that binary and um, tries to figure out, hey, are you trying to do something malicious here? And if you are, it stops you from running it. Um, so it doesn't prevent bad code getting into your browser, but it tries to prevent bad code from executing in your browser. Um, and then, of course, it guarantees, um, to, guarantee, to provide that sandbox, it actually excludes a bunch of APIs. So you do have the full power of C, C++, and all the rest in your browser, uh, but it doesn't allow uh, forking. Uh, you can't just willy-nilly access your file system or you know, do something uh, to that extent. And if you go to the, to the link at the bottom, you can actually find um, a full list of documented syscalls that are disabled. So let's take a quick example of how this actually works. So imagine you have an HTML web page and we're trying to load this native client module. Um, in this HTML web page, we load the module and we have this function that says, did the module load, right? Was it successful? We grab, so in this case, I'm actually just using the example from the native client site. So we have the hello tutorial. So we grab the, the ID of that tutorial or of the actual module. So it's just a DOM element that gets embedded. And we assign an event listener, listener which is the handle message. So basically, when uh, the native client uh, code sends us a message, our handle message method will get invoked in JavaScript. Pretty simple. And then to send a message to native client, it's as simple as just using post message. So if you guys have used web workers or anything um, similar to that in HTML5, this is exactly the same API. So it shouldn't make any difference. So, and that's actually one of the nice things about native client. You can mix web workers and native code um, kind of in the same way. Now, native client doesn't actually provide any sort of serialization. So in this case, I'm just sending a string. You can do whatever you want. You can um, stringify you know, JSON and send that in, but of course then you have to unpack it on the other side. So you can invent your own uh, serialization formats or do whatever you want. Completely up to you. Then on the actual native client side, um, there's of course a little bit more boilerplate because you know, we are working with C, C++, but here's kind of the minimal, simplest, silliest example that I could come up with, which is um, let's check um, that First, uh, we're getting a string, so this is, uh, we're receiving a hello message. We'll extract that message and we'll just create a reply which is gonna send the same message back to the client. So this is not very exciting, but it does do what we want. And then last but not least, in our actual web page, we just embed the native client module. And you can see here that I'm embedding the hello tutorial NMF. So NMF is the manifest file. So as I said earlier, because you're using something like GCC and that whole tool chain, you have to, or we have to figure out which platform your code is gonna run on. So x86, 32, 64-bit, maybe you're an, an ARM device. 
So the NMF file, basically, if you look at it, it's a JSON file that specifies, if this, for this architecture, download this executable. Very, very simple. And then your browser figures out which one it wants and loads it up. So what can you do with this? So the idea for a native client is to provide effectively the same APIs that you have access to in the browser. So you have stuff like audio. You can actually do some file I.O. So I, earlier I said you can't do file I.O. Not entirely true. There's two ways to do it. One is to actually use the HTML5 file I.O. So for example, you can get the user to click the input field, specify a file, and then you can just pipe it to native client and do something with it. And then native client also provides a, kind of a scratch pad surface area where you can um, store some temporary files as you're processing and doing something. So there's, the, there's graphics, mouse input events, a URL loader, so you can basically get the browser to invoke um, a remote fetch, so something like an AJAX request directly from native, cl native client and all the rest. But the key takeaway here is you have the same privileges as the JavaScript runtime, right? So this, is, this addresses our original problem. You can't just go to the file system or you can't just spawn a process to download a web page or what have you. You have to respect the same boundaries that the JavaScript runtime gives you within the browser. So in JavaScript, we can't just save a file to your, I don't know, temp folder on your machine or change the background or do something crazy like that. So this is the same, same deal. But the added benefit of all of this is you do have access to all of the C and C++ library. In fact, you even have stuff like pthreads, right? So you can actually, so browsers today are single thread. It's actually kind of crazy when you think about it. We have the JavaScript runtime, we have the layer engine, we have everything in between. It's all single threaded. It's all, um, we don't have any parallelism across different cores. Now that's not entirely true with Chrome because as we said, every tab is a separate process. So that actually gives it a little bit of a speed boost. Um, but within the specific tab, Right. If our uh, rendering engine decides to take two minutes to do something, you're stuck. Um, so with uh, Knackle, you can actually spawn uh, threads and they'll do exactly what you think they should do. And a lot of people have been porting libraries to Knackle. So because you have to recompile them with a specialized tool chain, there are some modifications that need to be made. So you can find stuff like GSL, you know, GNU Chess. So if you want to build a, if you have a C or C++ a plus plus library, and there's many of those which are very good, and you want to build, let's say, uh, a chess uh, game in your browser, you can just grab GNU chess and just pipe it into Chrome, right, and run it right in the browser. Um, one of the original use cases or motivations for this kind of stuff was processing video, um, audio processing, and all the rest. So, of course, you'll find a lot of, a lot of uh, libraries that are doing this kind of stuff in native clients. So, you can um, do video editing in Chrome by running native uh, native code on your machine, right? So you're not doing, you're not, you're not trying to do that in JavaScript, which is actually kind of cool. And you can imagine companies like um, Autodesk and others would be interested in this kind of thing because, you know, when you have a use case that's um, very CPU intensive, 3D modeling and all the rest, there's a lot of benefit to having um, something like this run in the browser because you get the benefit of uh, both, both worlds. So, full circle. Um, can we get Ruby running on native client, right? Um, it does run C and C++ code, so in theory it should work. And in fact, it does. So because native client code or native client is rapidly changing, um, the API is still in active development, you'll, to get this to work, you will actually need Chrome 9. The only problem is I bet you none of you know which version of Chrome you're running. So I know that I have Chrome 9 running because Chrome 9 still has the, oh, you guys can't see the, can't see the icon. Let me go back. So here we go. So if I go to Chrome, about Google Chrome, so I have Chrome 9 running. So this is a build from about a year ago. And if we look at the latest version, oops, it's actually version 14. Right, so there's been five major iterations in the last year, which is in itself, I think, pretty amazing. But let's go back to this. So this is Chrome 9. The, the APIs have changed slightly. So we have uh, native client running in here. We have Ruby running, so we can do something like that. And it prints, hi, I'm Ruby. Now, 
Let's do something slightly more interesting. Right, so we can call object methods and you can see all the methods that object has. And of course, just to prove the point, we can do the same thing as we did earlier with try Ruby. We can go to the network tab and let's do that again. <coughs> and if all goes well, you should see no network um, traffic in here because this is actually truly running in the browser. And if we look at the actual source, um, you can see that I'm embedding the Nexi um, right within here. In fact, I'm, I'm even skipping the, uh, the manifest file. So this is, this is for demo purposes for something that would actually run you know, for many different clients. Um, you'd want to use the, the manifest file. So this is kind of interesting. And in fact, you know, I, have, uh, I launched Chrome from uh, command line here. So you can actually see that it's running on my computer and you know here it is, it's invoking these commands. The nat native client is just spitting out stuff to standard out on the command line as well. So I'll just kill Chrome here and you can see, oops. So NACL was, a year ago NACL was behind a flag so I have to enable NACL, disable sandbox and I can then launch this process uh, with a kind of standalone profile. So this is, back here. So that's, that's kind of a cute example. Um, let's look at something slightly more interesting. How about running Quake in the browser? <laughs> All right. So here it is. Let's just. Okay, unfortunately, can't resize it, but if we look at the source here, So we have, we're loading the Quake manifest file right there. Um, you guys can't see that. Quake NMF, it's a NACL extension. So let's go back. Um, it's a fully functional uh, Quake. So let me actually, it even has audio. Oops. Sorry? Yeah. That's a good question. So here it is. Okay, so I suck at this game. But um, multiplayer, no, right? Because you don't have access to the network. You can't just open a socket. Does JavaScript allow you to open a socket to a random server? No. So this is the same constraint that NACL gives you, right? You can't just open a random socket. You can uh, invoke a, U a URL HTTP fetch. But you can't just say like connect to this whatever port twenty five and you know send some spam mail for me. So that's Quake in a browser, and you know th there are many more interesting demos of this kind of stuff. So what ha what you needed to do to make this work is basically take the original source code, use the tool chain that the NACL team provides, compile it, and then just embed it in uh, in the browser. So that's pretty cool. So the question is, what about uh, DOM manipulation? Um, yes, it's getting better. So if you remember the, um, the silver, silver light example, you, you saw the block right within your, your code. So that one was v very nice. NACL right now, they're targeting more of the high performance computing type angle. You can certainly do a DOM manipulation because you can, you can connect, you can imagine building a bridge through the Pepper API to say, you know, I'm sending you this command, so do something. And then, yes, you can do that. You have to do it yourself. Then, right? Correct. If you wrote the method, you'd have to translate it back to a DOM manipulation. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Which is basically what the Gestalt project is all about anyway, right? They basically built a, a, a JavaScript library on top, which just makes that simpler. So native client, uh, by default, does not provide anything like that. So, OK, let me, I still have Quake running in the background. I can hear the sound. There we go, much better. All right, so what's the future of native client? This is all kind of cool, but you know, where's it heading? So native client is a plugin in Chrome. Turns out it's actually going to be replaced. So I said it was under 
active development, what's happening is there's this new project called Pinacle, which is portable Nacle, which we'll talk about um, in a second. And um, it is available um, within Chrome. So if you're using Chrome, if you, uh, if you open a new tab and you uh, type in about plugins, you'll actually see a list of plugins that are enabled or disabled uh, within your browser. And most likely you'll find that if you're using the latest version of Chrome, um, you'll find that native client is enabled. Now, it's not enabled outright, it's enabled in the Chrome Web Store. So what this means, if you guys have used Chrome Web Store, if you deploy a Web Store app, you can actually use native clients to do crazy stuff, like uh, you build a video editing app, you can put it into Web Store, and you can use native clients within Chrome to do that kind of thing. But I think their vision long term is to actually enable it outright. You know, there's, there's some questions uh, there still about adoption from other vendors, but uh, that's a different story. So some examples of this. Um, anybody here uses a Chromebook or used a Chromebook? All right, a few people. So about a few weeks ago, I believe, um, there was an announcement that Chromebook can now play Netflix video, or you can stream Netflix. And this is done through native client. So Netflix has some requirements for their own DRM, right? They, they run their own stuff. And to make that work, it's a native client uh, plugin that is installed in Chrome and hence you can um, stream Netflix to Chromebooks now. Some of the other examples of native client in the wild which I think are very, very interesting. So there's Google App Engine. Google App Engine today officially supports a bunch of languages. So there's uh, Go which is still I believe in beta, there's Python which is the original one and then there's Java. Python currently is version 2.4 which is ancient and the way to make that work is they basically took the Python code ripped out a whole bunch of stuff that they felt as insecure basically to try and sandbox Python. So you can't, you know, because it's running as a platform, as a service, you can't just um, open a random connection. You in fact have to use the uh, Google App Engine API for make this request for me, please. And you can't just write to a local file system. So that was basically, they took the source code, modified it, ripped out all the stuff that they felt was unnecessary, and then um, ran this. So that's getting replaced. Um, if you look on the discussion and the mailing list for App Engine, very, very soon there's going to be Python 2.7 on App Engine. And App Engine uh, in Python 2.7 is running through native client. So instead of modifying the source, they're just taking the Python code, compiling it against native client, and all code will run in native client on App Engine, which is pretty cool, right? Because this is a generic way to take any, um, any project and basically make it available. And one of the benefits of this is they can now think about exposing native extensions on App Engine. Because now you could, as a developer, you could actually say, well, you know what, if I can compile this um, against native client, then I can guarantee as a third party user that I won't wreak havoc on your platform as a service. So maybe there's gonna be a way to upload your native extension to App Engine and just say like, oh yeah, you know, optimize this for me. I had this video editing task. So, um, you know use that instead, which I think is, is actually very cool and very powerful. And then the other project um, which uh, Google announced back in uh, March of this year, I believe, is ExaCycle, which is actually really, really awesome. Um, they said they're gonna donate one billion CPU core hours to scientific computing. So if you're a researcher, you can apply for this, um, and Google has a few, a few clusters of machines lying around. <laughs> One or two, yeah. Maybe a spare rack somewhere. And they're gonna use that spare rack somewhere to give you 1 billion CPU hours. So it's a big rack. <laughs> and the way that works is you write your code and it's gonna run a native client because it's gonna run on Google's infrastructure and they want a way to isolate you from you know, doing crazy stuff on Google's infrastructure. So. Um, that's yet another application, which I think is pretty cool. So uh, the moral of the story here is native client is not just a plugin for your browser. You can actually use it for other things as well. In fact, there's, there's a talk uh, later in the day on sandboxing Ruby. You can use native client to sandbox Ruby. That's effectively what we've done um, in the demo earlier, right? And we guarantee that there's no file I.O. or anything um, that can cause problems. So uh, Pinacle, portable Nacle, where, what are we doing here? They did a bunch of research and, and realized that, hey, what we're doing with this manifest file building against different architectures is actually not that great. Uh, what if we did something different? What if we compiled down to LLVM bitcode? 
and actually just provided an LLVM um, <laughs> runtime within the browser, right? And that is what portable, that, that is portable MACL. So it'll support um, x86, 32, 64-bit, and ARM. And the only difference is uh, when you compile your code, once again, there's a specialized uh, tool chain. You'll just have to use the PNACL GCC, and that'll basically emit the LLVM bit code, which then gets run in your browser um, on, the bare basic, on the bare hardware uh, of your machine. So that's pretty awesome, right? So now we have LLVM in the browser, and this is like, oh man. Because there's a lot of interesting stuff built for LLVM. Fortran is available in LLVM. You can run Fortran in, in the browser. So, the, and of course, you know, we have Rubinius, which is based on uh, LLVM. There's, it's a little bit more tricky than maybe other languages to get running, but still. We have C, C++, Mac, Ruby, PyPy, Objective-C. There's dozens of languages that are already targeting LLVM. So that's when I discovered this project. So there's a project called mscripten, and I'm hoping, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, which is an LLVM to JavaScript compiler, which is mind-blowing when you think about it. So it takes, what does it do? It takes the LLVM bitcode, so you take your C, C++, whatever, you compile it to bitcode. Then you run that bitcode through mscripten, and what it does is it translates it to JavaScript. <laughs> Just freaking awesome. So that means you can take that bitcode and you can run it natively on your machine, or you can run it in the browser. So that means we can run Python, Lua, C, whatever. And in fact, there's even a Ruby project. So mscripted Ruby, it's basically Ruby 187 that's been modified uh, to, you know, it ripped out a whole bunch of functionality to meet the NACL standards. And, or not NACL standards, uh, to compile um, against um, LLVM. And we can actually try it. So here is, and I'm hoping Wi Fi will work. Oh, come on. Yay. All right. So LLVM, mscripten, Ruby, right? So one plus one. So that's nice. We can once again, you know, check that there's nothing crazy going on here. Ah, it's still loading resources. So, okay. You'll just have to trust me that it's not actually <laughs> making any requests to any external service. It's actually running in the browser. It's through this bridge. And the cool thing is, remember how we said that there's a lot of languages targeting LLVM? Well, even on this site alone, you can see that it provides, hey, we can run QBasic in a browser. We can run forth. There's the Ruby version. There's Lua. There's Scheme. There's JavaScript. I'm not sure why you would want to write JavaScript. <laughs> but, okay. Um, Lol code. So I think this is pretty awesome. So I, <laughs> I ended up on the site yesterday and I spent too much time um, on this one specifically. So we can do, right? Sorry? Uh, no, no. So that, no, that wouldn't work. And all right, so how many people here have, this is a slight diversion, but I think this will be fun. How many people have written lol code? Okay, you guys need to try it out. It's pretty awesome. So I spent some time yesterday, so I have a cheat sheet here. So we're declaring a variable, and we're then, then we're gonna ask for standard, standard input, right? So give me animal. Now I wanna check uh, what type of animal it is. Um.
Okay. It's kind of hard to see. All right, I'm hoping. I have to. My problem yesterday was I was typing the right grammatical terms, and that was causing. Okay, so let's try this. All right. We can run this again. There you go. So we have little code running in the browser um, through the magic of LLVM, JavaScript, and a few other things in between. So this is crazy. Can you, can you use LOL, LOL code to inspect the challenge? I'm sure you can, yes. <laughs> so this is, this is JavaScript, right? This is JavaScript running in your browser. So for all intents and purposes, you can do anything the heck you want. I'd love to see that. Uh, me too. <laughs> Sounds like a pretty nice project. So this is not an exhaustive list, right? So the point of this was, hey, this is kind of a curious exploration of what, what would it mean if we tried to get Ruby in a browser. Um, we talked about three different but, but somewhat related uh, stacks. So on the left, there is the Silverlight DLR, which I think is actually a really, really awesome project. I hope that that team is, will continue working on this project. It seems like they've you know, gone silent for a while. Um, then there is the Google stack, which is the portable native client, uh, which allows you to run C, C++, and soon, in, in 2012, um, they'll switch to um, LLVM. And then there is the, the last one that we just talked about, which is mscripten, which, which instead of having a different um, binary and then having that pepper bridge, it runs directly on top of JavaScript. So these are kind of three different approaches. And the interesting thing is the last two are actually possibly complementary. So remember that we said that um, native client is today available in Chrome. There are actually plugins for um, other WebKit browsers. There is Fire a Firefox plugin. And I think there's even an IE, an, uh, an IE plugin, although I'm not sure. Um, it's not officially supported by those browsers. So you know that's still an outstanding question in terms of, I think Firefox is more or less as, or at least their developers have said, hey, we're, we don't like native client. That's kind of the status quo today. So anyway, one potential crazy stack that you can come up with is to say, well, we'll have an LLVM sandwich, which is we'll have the browser, we have the Pinnacle runtime, which is the, the native code, and then you know, as a fallback, if you don't have native client available, we can actually run it still in your browser through emscripten. And you know that's kind of nuts, but it would work. It wouldn't be very fast when you run it through the JavaScript version, but um, that's, that's still something that's being entertained by these teams. So in summary, I think innovation is good. I think we need a lot more of it in the browser. Uh, JavaScript is fun, but um, I would love to see more languages. Right? I really, really, truly hope that JavaScript is not the end all. Like, I would not want to find myself writing JavaScript in 20 years. I'm hoping we get invent something better. So I would encourage you guys to play, experiment, and you know, push the boundaries. And then um, in terms of the actual resources, uh, there's, you know, I've covered a lot of ground. Um, you can just Google for NACL and PNACL. There's actually quite a bit of interesting information available. There's a really good Google I.O. session for which there's an available video which talks in depth about um, what does this, how does this thing work, how do you connect it, and it actually gives you um, a play-by-play -play example of building a native client um, extension for the browser. So with that, um, thank you very much. And any questions, thoughts, ideas, complaints? <laughs> Right, so the question is, um, what about Google Dart? How does it uh, play together or not at all with this stuff? Um, so to be honest, I don't know much about Dart. And for, for those of you who are not familiar with Dart, um, there was recently a, a doc file, a PDF, I don't know, something that leaked um, intentionally or not, I don't know, uh, that, is basically, that basically says, hey, JavaScript is not the end all, surprise. And in fact, we're going to invent a better language. Right? And we're going to call it Dart, and we're working on it, and we'll convince everybody to use it. <laughs> um, so I, good luck with that. 
I, I don't know. Um, I think um, it suffers from the same problem to me as JavaScript. It's like, it's cool, awesome, a new language in the browser, and maybe it's better than JavaScript, and I can script a DOM with it. But you know, what if I disagree with your syntax, or what if I want a different construct? I think what we're missing in the browser, within the browser, is that capability to just say, like, I want to try a crazy idea. I want to try a different syntax. CoffeeScript is a great example, right? It's like this one thing came along and now everybody's falling over it. It's like, oh, this is so great. ECMAScript is changing their spec to match some of the CoffeeScript syntax. It's like, oh, well, that's cool. Imagine what, what we could do if we actually enabled that to a wider demographic and you know, unleash some of that power. So the short answer is I don't know, um, but I'm still curious to find, I, I don't actually know much about the Dart internals. So the actual libraries are basically disabled. So if you try to, let's say, require TCP socket, it'll just say, I can't even find TCP socket. If you try to do exec, um, it'll just say there's you know, not, not allowed or can't do it. Um, by default, what NACL does is, let's say you do get some malicious code into the user's browser and you're trying to do something bad. When it detects that, it'll just kill the tab altogether or it'll abort the whole thing. Right? So once again, NACL does not prevent bad code from getting in. You can serve basically anything you want to the client, uh, but at runtime, it'll do some checking. And you know, there's a little bit of a performance hit, obviously, associated with that. Um, depending on the benchmarks, I think I've seen like 5, 10, 15%, but still, it's much, much faster than anything else. So WebSockets, yes, you can certainly use WebSockets. So once again, uh, in NACL, you have the same privileges and same access to anything as the JS runtime, right? So you could, you can, today, you can uh, very easily open a WebSocket connection, but WebSocket connection is not actually a, a socket, right? It's basically, it's an HTTP session that gets upgraded to a bi-directional channel. So you can't just say like, oh yeah, WebSocket, open, Connection once again to port 25, let's send some spam. Uh, that, that's not gonna work. But in native client, you could say, okay, I have this uh, WebSocket connection open, let's pipe the data back and forth. Sure, sure. So um, I've tried to summarize that. So there's the RubyJS project that you can, is basically compiled Ruby to JavaScript, um, but you know, there's missing stuff like standard library and debugging is a hell, and you know, is that even practical in the long run? So the short answer is, I think the, an the immediate answer to that is no, it's not practical. I think it's more interesting to, to play with and think about. Um, I'm not trying to, so the title of the talk is obviously Ruby in a browser, but to me Ruby is just an example, right? I'm not sure, I'm not convinced that Ruby is the right tool for the browser. Maybe, maybe it is, maybe it's not. Uh, but what I would like to see is something like, I would love for the browsers to just say, you know what? LLVM in the browser. Everybody provides that. Um, you can build whatever the heck. DOM bindings, please. Yes, with DOM bindings, please. Um, so let's provide that and then we can once, once again push some of that ability to innovate back to the web developers, not to the standards body that is ECMAScript that mandated that thou shalt not do file IO. It's like, well, you know, not exciting. Uh, NACL? Sorry. Well, So I've seen some discussions about supporting an LLVM um, in the browser. Um, I think right now there's uh, basically the Chrome team is on the fence. I mean, they're obviously they're building uh, portable NACL and, and all the rest, so they're they're open to the idea. I think the Firefox team is a little is against it. Uh, they basically said, um, you know, let's we're not going to do it. 
although they are now in parallel building their own language called Rust to uh, basically provide some of the same functionality. So, it, you know, I, I think there, there's competing interests there. But which once again points to this problem of like, now we need all of the vendors to agree on something and Firefox thinks Rust is the best thing ever and everybody else thinks it's something else. Um, Go and LVM, uh, pff, not sure. Uh, I'm sure it's doable, um, but I'm not sure if there, there, there's a port of it. We actually have some Go programmers in here. Is that not not possible? No. Okay. So today not possible. Tomorrow maybe. <laughs> So can you use Speedy? So Speedy is yet another Chrome innovation. It's basically uh, saying um, HTTP hasn't been updated since 1997, which is the 1.1 spec. Uh, let's invent something better. So we have bidirectional communication. You can do actual multiplexing and all the rest. Um, the short answer is yes. You can, of course, once again, you're within the JavaScript sandbox. It doesn't actually matter what you fetch data from. So if you remember the APIs, there's a URL uh, loader API. It actually doesn't care, right? Because Speedy is um, an upgrade to an HTTP. If you look at the protocol, you make a request, it does an, an auto negotiation that says, oh yeah, you can use Speedy, so let me send your data back. So as a developer, you probably wouldn't even be aware of it. But if you're providing both the client and the server, then you can obviously optimize your infrastructure to say, I'm gonna serve my content over Speedy. Which by the way, Google does, I don't know how many of you guys know, uh, but Speedy is enabled by default in your Chrome web browser, and chances are when you access Google today, you're actually running over Speedy, not HTTP, which is pretty crazy and awesome. All right, so I think we're done, thank you.